So now I want to back up into this human relations. Now some of you who maybe attended local universities answered this question when you were getting into your programs and maybe didn't even realize that you did. Because a lot of the colleges use this as an entrance question to determine which candidates they're going to take into their MAT programs, their education programs, whatever that program may be. And what we're going to do, and we're actually using this in our school district now, we will be using this very shortly as part of our screening tool for applicants. So when they're doing their interview, they've already answered this question once, so you may not have to ask it, but you could ask it again just to see what they would give in a live scenario. But what we're doing is you're thinking of a significant past event which involved yourself in a teaching role with one or more persons. And then from a human relations standpoint, this event had special meaning. And that's the important part. It has to have special meaning. And we're going to have these applicants write about this event. And they're going to answer essentially four questions. First, they're going to describe the question as it occurred at that describe the situation as it occurred at that time. Then they're going to say, what did you do in that particular situation? And then how did you feel about the situation at the time you were experiencing it? So this is kind of the, the, the snapshot of at that time, their natural tendency. What came out of them when they were in that situation? And then finally, the reflective question, which is how did you feel about the situation now wish to change any part of it. Now in reflection, kind of a, a key to, to remember here is I would hope after reflecting that I come up with the right answer. So even though it's important to see what they would do to make themselves better, we really want to focus in on these first three which is what was it that was so important to them that they wanted to tell us about? What did they do and then at that time what was their mindset? What were their thinking? What were their natural tendencies and reactions? You know, if you ask this type of question, this forces them to answer all four of those categories from the rubric. So we should be able to make a pretty good determination of the dispositions of that individual because we've addressed every possible category that there is the questions. Would this be easy, do you think, to answer face-to-face -face in a live setting? No, very, very difficult. I actually tried in an interview at one point in time. The candidates were, were flabbergasted, for lack of a better term. They didn't know how to answer it. They spent more time sitting there trying to think about well, what was important than it was for them focusing on what they did at the time and then what their reflection was. So what we've realized is this is better to do as a screening tool. So maybe if you have applicants that you've narrowed it down to maybe five individuals. You can ask them this type of question and see how they respond. But realizing that this could be a great tool to screen people, what we've done is our interview, or actually our application, has been modified for certified staff. And soon classified staff will follow suit. But this is the first question they get asked on the questionnaire. And I bet some of you remember when you applied to our district, there were, at the time, there were 12 questions that you had to answer. It was a supplemental questionnaire. You probably don't remember any of those questions. And you may not even remember the answers that you gave. Of those 12 questions, two truly measured your disposition. The other 10 were more teacher perceiver type questions about what would the teacher do in the classroom. Kind of more nuts and bolts, black and white type of information. But this question gets beyond that. It really forces somebody to think and to give you a little bit about what makes them tick, what's in the inside. And as we go through the material that's presented today by Dr. Combs and then also by Dr. Mark Basisco from Northern Kentucky University, and the, the work that they did blended together leads to us being able to use this rubric and answer, by using the rubric, take this answer and see how those individuals fall. Are they sevens or sixes or fives? Or are they one, twos, and threes? And we want to shy away from them. So at this point in time, we want to actually practice. I've talked a lot, more than I would like to. So now I want to give you the, the time to see how does this work together. 
And if you would, we're going we're gonna to look at some of these human relations incidents and keep, keep in mind that these were answers written by undergrad and graduate students enrolled in college courses. So some of these scenarios that we're going to read to those questions I just had up on the board are not necessarily a classroom setting, but it was something that they found important to them to write about. That's what we're going to be scoring using this rubric today. If you would, we have this thick packet, Assessing Educator Dispositions. We're going to go to page 22. And we want to look at a situation where we're just looking only at perception of self to get started. So you see the definitions at the top, what it means to be identified, what it means to be unidentified. So for perception of self, if the teacher is someone that we probably want to consider hiring, it's the teacher feels a oneness with all people. She or he perceives him or self as deeply and meaningfully related to persons of every description. As you're reading these situations that the individuals give us, you want to keep that in your mind. That definition should be kind of flowing through your mind as you're reading and, and trying to understand, are, are they, do they feel this oneness with all people? The opposite of that, the unidentified, is the teacher that feels generally apart from others. They have feeling of oneness and restricted to those of similar beliefs. So as you read through a scenario, that's kind of what you want to take a look at is, are they identified? unidentified. And we'll worry about giving them a numerical score later, but at this time we really want to take a, take a look at an example and just see if you can determine by reading what you've read if it's very obvious what one of these categories are. So at this point I'll let you and with your partners individually read the part that's in italics at the bottom of page 22 and it carries over to page 23. I do need to ask that you keep the booklet kind of the way it is and flip it over. That way we're only seeing what we need to see and we're not, we're not cheating and looking at the answers. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to read that and then we'll kind of discuss as a group what answer you would have come with. I've been reviewed the scenario now on page 22. I'm curious to see what you thought of this individual? Do we feel that they have perception of self that means they have a oneness with all people or do they feel generally apart from others? Do I, do I have a group that's willing to say maybe what number that they scored on the scale of seven down through one? Yes? We said five. Okay. And for what reason did you go with the five? We didn't like the word snoopy. Snoopy. Okay. That negative connotation. Okay. The idea that you felt like you had to pry in order to get some information. You felt like you should have gotten to know the student somehow a little bit better than asking that impersonal kind of uh, direction. Okay. Did anybody else feel similar uh, feelings to that word snooping? Was anybody okay with it and could talk to why they were okay with it? Okay, and based on that, what number did you end up giving to this individual? I, I gave it seven. Okay, a seven. So we have a five and a seven. I was just going to back up something. I think our first statement was extremely poor because the crowd kind of dive into maybe the student wouldn't have been looking at the same information. So that might have been an evidence for the score. I was, I was back and forth with five or six, so five and a six. Okay.
probably needs to be some actual investigating to say, you know, this is a mistake of pride there, and it's certainly not well structured. Structured in the way that we might have other institutions. Okay. And what number did you assign? I gave him six. You gave him six? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it sounds like we are. So, what did the professionals say? If we turn to we see that professional raters scored this a six. And based on the margin of error that we have of plus one, minus one, if you are a seven, a six, or a five, then you are within what a perceptional rater would have assigned to this scenario. In these training materials that we're starting out with here, below where the score shows, they talk about the rationale behind why the score was selected. So it kind of gives you a little more insight, understanding about, you know, why did we go seven, six, or five as opposed to one, two, or three. The word snooping came up as a negative. In the very first sentence that you see underneath the score says, a perceptual rating must be independent of personal likes and dislikes. So we may not like the fact that we had snoop in an individual's locker to determine why or what they did or didn't have for lunch. But in the scheme of things, the teachers were looking at the bigger picture and that they were worried about this student and they wanted to make sure the student could perform. So even though they maybe took an avenue that we don't like, they were doing it for the students' betterment and so that they could have what they need, which is the nourishment to then pay attention in class and be able to stay awake. So probably something that it it's hard to keep in mind as we read through these examples, which is, can I separate my personal likes and dislikes away from what actually is going on in the case? So, and that was thrown in there for that reason, kind of to show you that some of the answers you get, personally you may not agree with, but professionally, do we agree with the message and what they were trying to accomplish? I would say, based on our answers, that yes, that was the case. Now we'd like to take a look at page 27. We'll go to the next area of our rubric. And now we're looking at a, a, an example of perceptions of others. And before we read the scenario, we want to know what definition that we're looking at. When we're looking at perception of others, we want to make sure that we see others as having the capacity to deal with their problems. He or she believes others are basically able to find adequate solutions to events in their own lives. Now that may sound challenging in education because you're putting a lot of faith in your students, but I think that's what ultimately what we're trying to do. We're trying to teach them to be able to make decisions. Maybe a teacher in this category that is, does not have a good perception of others would see others as lacking the necessary capacities to deal effectively with their problems. He or she doubts their ability to make their own decisions and in turn run their own lives. Micromanaging, that's probably the easiest way to think of this category. If they're a micromanager, probably not an effective teacher in the end because are they really teaching the kids or are they just directing them into doing a behavior? So that's kind of what we're looking at when we go through this category. Maybe an easy way to keep that in mind. So if we flip over to page 28, we have a shorter scenario to read this time. I'm going to give your group a chance to read that and then head and assign a number from seven down through one about what you believe for this category. Okay, so we just read about little Johnny and his broken glasses. Just out of curiosity, what kind of scores did it did, were assigned, and then we'll come back and maybe talk to a group or two about why they went with their numbers. Gentlemen, what numbers thrown out? Um, kind of a six or five. I mean, somewhere in there. Uh, they did. They did allow John to to come forth and to to kind of deal with what had happened on the playground. Um, it was just the scenario was kind of. Okay. Numbers? I had a six. Okay. Overall feeling. I mean, I just, I didn't, I didn't give the phone call. 
public appearance, but kind of an overall <laughs> feeling which can clearly follow the age of science. Okay. okay. Five and a six. Similar reason. Six. Sixes. Okay. Were there any words in there that it sounded like we touched on a little bit, but any words that made us think, I don't know if I really liked what's going on here. I really do like the thought that they did get the responsibility back to the teacher. Obviously, that's something else that happens. She's got the answers. The teacher has already clearly investigated the situation. Like it wasn't she didn't ignore the problem or anything like that. But what I didn't like about it is after he did, you know, say this is what happened, she just said, okay, go tell your mother. She didn't follow up with the phone call. Someone who deals with discipline would not bring it up to be a phone call made that to happen. Right. So there are definitely elements of, well, you know, if I were in charge, there's a little bit more that needs to happen than what did happen. And we have administrators in the room, which is probably why that might would be true. Uh, from a teacher's perspective, heat of the moment, it maybe seemed like the right thing to do. But if we get kind of past that and we look at the overall what was going on, I think our numbers indicate that this teacher probably was doing a good job in this case. Something to add? I, I was just going to ask, sure. does this go back to the conversation of good versus getting better and analyzing it from a getting better standpoint that you know, functionality is there, the, the ability to work with the student is there, it just not, might not be necessarily what we want a teacher to do in a given situation. Right, and that, that, that's a very good point. So what did the professionals say? If we turn to page 29, we see that they gave it a score of a 6. So if you were in the 7, 6, or 5 range, then you were right in line with what the professionals said. And it's the very first statement underneath there where they're explaining the rationale, the teacher showed trust in the coping ability of children. She believed the children, if left to themselves, would tell her the truth. Kind of a leap as I mentioned earlier, the take when you're dealing with kids that they're going to get the truth. And you, as it was pointed out, we have three different stories. We don't really know which one's true. There is a happy end that the truth comes out, but it's not always quite that easy, as many of you already know. So now we want to take a look at our next category, perception of purpose. And we're going to go to page 31 for this one. And just as a review, the definition would be, the educator views events in a broad perspective. This is the big picture. His goals extend beyond the immediate larger implications and context. Conversely, we would have the small picture. The educator views events in a narrow perspective. Her purpose is focused on immediate, specific goals. So with that in mind, we'd like you to take a look at the story on page 32. You do that and then we will discuss. This one's a little more challenging. We have Roger who more than likely has an IEP or a 504. We don't know which, but we can tell that there's some sort of disability. And we have a teacher who, as I heard one group say, thinks that she's doing the right thing. So based on what we've read, we'll st let's start with the scores first before we discuss. Gentlemen, what numbers did you come up with? We're on the opposite end of the spectrum. Okay. I was on the low end. So two. Five. Okay. Three. Four and five. Two. 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 Okay. So one a little more challenging. It's a little bit longer. They give us a lot more information to have to decipher through. Uh, we, we do have a teacher that thinks that they're trying to do the right thing and in the end probably feels pretty confident she did the right thing and that's what the that last statement would lead you to believe. Kind of gets back to the, the questions themselves which is in the end the teacher is reflecting about what should they have done or what would they have done differently. So kind of making a giving a positive spin. But if we look back at the body of what's going on, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of different information kind of working its way through this scenario that makes it a little more challenging. So what did the professionals tell us? And if we turn the page to 34, we see that they scored at a three with 
in a mirror to allow us to have a two or a four. Now four is kind of a category that we'll talk about in a little bit, but it, it does kind of infer that either you didn't have enough information to make a decision or you just couldn't tell from what you've read. And with all these positives and negatives in this situation, they kind of cancel each other out. And why some may tend to score in the middle saying, well, I mean, there's, there's elements of it that are good. There's some that just, I don't think that's how I would have handled that situation. Now, the experts tell us that the person in this incident tends to perceive in a smaller way. The concern is with the immediate situation, which is the boy's inability to perform on that class test. The teacher perceives the job is correct enabling children based on their immediate performance rather than helping students to succeed in life. But in the end, there is some redemption in the teacher's handling of the situation by allowing the student to return the book. So there is a little bit that's going on that was a positive situation. So that one was a little more and the more information you get, the more you got to decipher through and that's where hopefully through this practice and then the use of the rubric and kind of looking at the definitions that we are able to decide what truly is going on. That takes us to our final category, which is frame of reference. We're going to go to page 36, and we see that we have two definitions that we're going to look at. The educator is concerned with the human aspects of affairs. The attitudes, feelings, beliefs, and welfare of persons are prime considerations in his or her thinking. So a very positive oriented putting people first versus educators concerned with the impersonal aspects of affairs. They're worried about order, mechanics, details of things, and events. That's their prime consideration in their thinking. So they're, they're worried, they're nitpicking, looking at all those little tiny details that maybe some teachers can get stuck on. Keeping those two definitions in mind, what I'd like for you to do is our final example that we're going to do together here is to read from bottom of page 36, over on the 37, the little story that we have, and then between the two of you and your group, make a determination about what direction that you would have taken when scoring general frame of reference. Very good discussion on this particular case, because this one's a little bit different, because it's not necessarily a very specific teacher saying here's exactly what happened. They're kind of talking about discipline in general and then saying, well, and here's an example. Some of you, as we mentioned, are administrators, so your view of discipline may be a little bit different than the view of a teacher. So in this case, when we're talking about a student confides into you that, oh, you know, by the way, I brought a bottle of wine to school and left it at my locker. Yeah. Yeah. That might be a problem. But what do we, what do was the teacher do or what do we as administrator do in that particular situation? So out of curiosity, let's do the numbers first. What direction did we go with this mindset that we're hearing? Uh, four and a three. Four and a three. Four and five. 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 Okay. Okay, so we're, we're kind of in the middle. W what are the negatives in this scenario that we're hearing? Right. She wasn't concerned with the student's welfare. Because if she was concerned with the student's welfare, then she would take that into consideration and just as not talk about it. Yeah. The, the one line that, that I kept referring back to that, that put me lower on the scale was I generally follow Jesus' guidance. If, if this happens, if, if I hear it from someone, then I do this. If, if I, if 
by investigating myself, I did this. It seems very regimented and predictable and not. That they have one snippet at the end that they're, they're trying to build the student's trust. But aside from that, everything is very, A leads to this, B leads to neither one of them, which is oh. more lower on the scale. Okay. And very good discussion on this particular one, because I, I did find this one to be a little more challenging because you could kind of look at it from different perspectives and a very good perspective right there. So if we turn the page to see what did the professionals say? Professionals went with a four, which means our acceptable range would be a three, four, or a five. And then they do give some rationale that says the teachers are concerned with details and mechanisms of events, but realize that their purpose is to benefit people. Sometimes teachers forget the real purpose of education and start to perceive it as a matter of manipulating things rather than assisting people. The incident shows a teacher who is concerned with details and mechanisms of events and with policies. However, the concern for students and their rights was also expressed. So those, that kind of that 50-50 dichotomy again where it's, well, you know, for the most part, there's a lot of negative going on here. There's obviously teach, a student bringing alcohol to school is a big problem. Even though they're telling you a week later that they did it, there's still <clears throat> that's an issue. Then also the teacher said, but you know, at least I gave them the ability to come and talk to me about it. And, and maybe through that process, <clears throat> that teacher can, can say, you know, this is, this is not right and coach them to do the right thing. So the, the experts are kind of torn and they go with that four. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so now we see we've gone through all four together. And it's time to wrap it all, actually, we've individually. Now it's time to pull them in all together and kind of take our pre-exam, if you want to call it that, where we now are going to use all four elements together as we read a story. So we've been kind of looking at each little piece throughout these stories, but what happens when I have to score all four? And that's what we want to look at next. And how does that happen? Well, we're going to read the story just like we have, and then we're going to take each category individually. That's why it's important, as I mentioned, to read the definition so that way you realize, okay, as I'm reading this, first time I'm going to score it for category one. And I'm only going to score it for category one. And then I'll move on to the next category until I've done that for all four. Then I can go back and add up my totals. We're going to have a maximum possible of 28. You find a 28, you hire that person, site just right, right there. No more questions asked. But anything that's between an 18 and 28, and this is in general, not always, but typically indicates perceptions that have been demonstrated to be characteristics of an effective teacher. Those are the individuals that we're trying to hire. If you find a minimum of a 4, time to move on. But if it's between a 4 and a 14, in general, those individuals show characteristics that are not of effective teachers. History might play out that they're going to be an ineffective teacher. So those are the ones we're going to try to avoid. But there is a middle range. What if we're between this 14 and 18? It tells us a few things. That could mean that perceptions of these individuals are just acting up in the middle of the conditions. And that could also happen because maybe you just don't have enough information where the information you have doesn't fit the definition. So it is possible that you're going to score an individual four, and it's not a bad thing, and it's not always a good thing. It just it kind of falls right in the middle. Not enough information is probably the easiest way to think of if you're assigning a four. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to rate the human relation incident on a scale of one to seven for each category, for all four of the categories. We're going to use some practice materials that are I'm not going to say they're difficult, but there's sometimes it feels like I don't really have enough information, and sometimes it feels like I have too much information. But when you're doing this, there's a couple things that we've talked about today that I just wanted to repoint out so that you're aware of as we're going through. First of all, you want to treat this as a skill. The first few times you go through it, it may not feel like you're going to read what the professional said, and I'm like, man, I got it wrong again. It's a skill, so it gets better as you practice, and that's why we're practicing here today, and that's why you'll have some materials that you can practice with before you take your actual test. So in the beginning, don't be discouraged. 
I know the first couple that I did, I was on the exact opposite spectrum of what the professionals said. And then as I practiced more, I kind of understood how do these categories truly relate to what I'm looking for. So I was probably looking for a little too much detail, and I was letting my personal likes and dislikes get in the way of what was truly going on. So that's probably the next piece of advice that I want to make sure we remember is there's a big difference between perceptual rating, there's a big difference between my personal rating. We've got to kind of set our personal likes and dislikes to the side, and then we need to look at this from, you know, perception. Perceptually, what is going on? Am I, am I hitting these definitions that we were talking about before? And I only want to focus on the definitions. And if, I think if we do that here today, then you're going to find that this it's really not as difficult as maybe it has felt so far or it has sounded. So I, I think we're in a good direction and that everybody's going to do just fine. And in the end, everybody's going to pass the test and I'm not worried about that. So what we want to do now is we'll, we'll go ahead and do, we'll do one together as a group as a practice just to see you know, if I'm doing all four. Where did my numbers fall in line with everyone else in the room? So we are going to go to page, I believe it's 43, let me make sure, yes, page 43, it's labeled protocol number 51, we're going to have you read that as a group, actually read it individually, and then in small groups, you're going to use the rubric that's on page 45, and go ahead and assign a score to each of the four categories. Okay, so we had a chance to read about the rambunctious three-year-old who's running all over the place, making the life of the teacher apparently somewhat miserable here. More challenging because now we're looking at all four elements of this rubric, and as you can see, that's it really changes how you look at this answer when you have to change basically your lens that you're looking through four different times to really determine what's going on. Here. So I'm curious first about the, the numbers that we came up with, and I know that you may not have total to score, but just kind of in general, how many went to the five, six, or seven side? Well, we'll say, yeah, we'll, we'll do the first one. So the very first one, how many were on the, the high side, six or seven? And how many went to the low, one, two, or three? Anybody right in the middle? So we have a, a pretty even split in the class. Okay. So now we get the perceptions of others. The second area, how many went seven, six, or five? How many went one, two, or three? How many went to the middle of the four? Okay, so another even spread. Perception of purpose, seven, six, or five? One, two, or three? And then four? Anybody? Okay. So again, that one's pretty evenly split left to right. And then finally, frame of reference. How many went to the high side? Seven, six, or five? And then how many went one, two, or three? Anybody go right in the middle? No one? Okay, so we, everybody's pretty clear. Just to let you know, the very first time I did this, because this is my original book that I used, I went 6767. So what did the professionals tell us? If we turn the page, the professionals went with straight threes, which means that if you scored this a two, three, or four in each of the four categories, you are within a perceptual rate of reliability score of 80% of the time you hit with what they wanted which means that you would have passed your test. How many passed on the very first time? <laughs> I didn't. It, it, it is a skill, and it's something that as we practice and we take a look at these categories that we, that we get better with time. The nice thing here on the practice material is it tells us the rationale for each of the scores. Now, unfortunately, some of the rationales are not very clear-cut. I don't think they provide enough detail, but there are a total of eight practice scenarios you can review and I would strongly encourage that you do review them and see you know what would I give just like we did today read the story then read the definition for each of the areas of the rubric and only for it for that area and then go back and take a look at what the professionals did 
and, and try to compare. And I think by the end, you'll see that you've started to really pick up on that skill. And if you follow the, the kind of the rules that we've used, which is you really got to set aside the way you would have and look at truly look at the definition and see are they addressing the definition or are they not addressing it. And then your score will be very accurate compared to what the experts believe. And if you repeat that process, by the time you get the post-test, which is the part that we're actually going to be used to determine our professional perception graders, at that point you'll, be, you'll have a lot of confidence going into it. And one thing that I also would suggest is doing those practice scenarios and then into the actual test. Because if you put it away and come back a couple days later, I think you'll kind of have to recalibrate and go back and end up looking at the practice scenarios with the raters' explanations about why they chose. So I would just do it all at once to make it easier on yourself.